560 The Answer online at 560theanswer.com on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. If you're looking for the latest news, insight into what it means, and the sharpest opinion, there's only one station in Chicago where you can turn, and it's this one. We're AM560 The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. One of the values of Elon Musk's time at Twitter, at least so far, really has very little to do with Twitter. It's somewhat Trump-like in the way that he is exposing the censorious left for who they actually are and hopefully presenting to the public a clear picture of just how far removed the censorious left is from anything resembling First Amendment jurisprudence in this country. Anything resembling it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. We uh, played this uh, yesterday and chatted about it a bit with Dan Henninger from the Journal, Wall Street Journal. This was uh, Karine Jean-Pierre at a White House briefing earlier this week responding to the Musk tweet about Tony Fauci, which has been alternatively denounced by the left as oh. both uh, LGBTQ phobic because he invokes pronouns as well as dangerous to the well-being of Tony Fauci because he dares to suggest Tony Fauci should be prosecuted for his performance during COVID. Listen. Uh, these attacks, these personal attacks uh, that we have been seeing are dangerous. Uh, uh, on Dr. Fauci and other public health professionals as well. Uh, are, they are disgusting and they are divorced from, uh, from reality. And uh, we will continue to call that out and be very clear uh, about that. Again, these are incredibly dangerous, these personal attacks that we are seeing. Uh, Dr. Fauci has served under seven Republican and Democratic presidents. We cannot forget that. Uh, he has given, he has given uh, his almost entire career to civil, to civil service uh, public ser- as a public servant. Uh, his work on infectious disease from HIV AIDS to COVID has saved countless lives. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that he has, uh, you know, we, we are fortunate, I should say, that he has devoted his career uh, and his life uh, and his exceptional talent to the America's uh, public health, to America's public health. And that's what should be uh, discussed right now. That's what we should be thankful uh, to him about. And again, these are incredibly dangerous and should be called out. I'll leave it there. I, I mean, the tweet, pro- my pronouns are prosecute slash Fauci. Uh, merits a dangerous to the third power diatribe from the White House press secretary. Don't you think he was being a little sarcastic? Don't care. Who cares? What does that have to do with danger? What does that have to do? I mean, what, what she offered there is what New York State has codified into law. That's where this goes. The uh, hate crime or hate speech law in New York that requires blogs like the one Eugene Volokh runs or like the one our friend uh, Professor William Jacobson runs, Legal Insurrection, to um, respond to comments or to, to have a policy of responding to comments that, quote, vilify, humiliate, or incite violence against a group, you know, the way that Karine Jean-Pierre defines it, which is boundless, based on, quote, race, color, religion, ethnicity, national origin, disability, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. As defined by the state, as defined by the political left, as if the two are distinguishable. Eugene Volokh joins us now. He is a UCLA law professor. He's also the founder of the Volokh Conspiracy blog, and he penned this piece that we talked about earlier in the week in the journal about this New York state law and its implications for uh, bloggers like him and, uh, you know, a free people like we would like to be, I think. Professor Volokh, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. So um, have you gotten any response from the state officials to your argument that they're 
uh, that this law that was passed is uh, c- conscribing you to be uh, to, to violate uh, your First Amendment rights? Uh, yes. In fact, yesterday, as per the deadline set by the court, we got a response from the New York Attorney General's office. Uh, and uh, they are they are going full bore, uh, as, as is their job as lawyers, uh, to, uh, uh, to defend the statute. Um, they, uh, so the law is titled Social Media Networks, Hateful Conduct Prohibited. But to be fair, in the body of the law, it doesn't actually prohibit any that hateful conduct, they mean certain viewpoints that they find, that they believe are, are, are improper. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't actually prohibit them or order me as an operator of a blog or uh, Rumble as an operator of a social media network uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to block them. It does require us to have policies uh, and to publish policies on how we would deal with such hateful conduct. And we thought from reading it, it requires us to respond to people's uh, complaints because uh, it says that each social media network shall have a policy uh, which includes how such social media network will respond uh, to uh, reports of incidents of hateful conduct on their platform. Hateful conduct, again, just being certain what some people label hate speech. In the response, um, uh, the New York Attorney General's office says, actually, we don't have to respond at all. Even though the statute says it has to explain how we will respond to such incidents, they say it's okay to have a policy that just says, we don't care about incidents of hateful conduct. So they describe this law, which is titled Hateful Conduct Prohibited, as really doing almost nothing other than requiring us to have uh, to have a policy which could be just sort of an empty policy, or the, the you policy know, that's a step forward at least. Or the, the policy could be like I respond as I see fit. Like, exactly. That's a policy, right? Exactly. And look, that's better than requiring us to have some sort of militant policy or requiring us to to actually send uh, complain uh, responses uh, to complaints. Uh, it's hard for me to see how that's reconcilable with the text of the statute, but right. I think they're deliberately reading the statute super narrowly in order to to minimize uh, uh, problems. But yeah, they but, also but, but, claim. Well, sorry to interrupt, but but the problem, of course, is so they're being challenged. They know they don't have a constitutional leg to stand on, and so they're you know again offering the interpretation you described. But you, you still have them moving down a path and. They are going to move down that path, I would suspect, as quickly as they're allowed to. But that doesn't mean that just because they're now backing off a little bit in terms of their interpretation doesn't mean that their end game is any different. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And in fact, the, the title of the law, which, which is not the law itself, it's not the text. So I want to stress that. But the title of the law shows, I think, where, they're going, where they want to go. They call it social media networks hateful conduct prohibited because that's what uh, the uh, the New York government would like to do. That was their plan. Perhaps they 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 didn't uh, delete it from the title when they were alerted that they couldn't that they weren't allowed to do it. But their goal is to do as much as they can uh, to uh, restrict viewpoints that they disapprove of. So, for example, vilify or humiliate on the basis of religion, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Of course, many people think that uh, the claims that uh, transgender athletes shouldn't compete on women's uh, sports teams think uh, are humiliating based on gender identity, or for that matter, sharp disapproval of particular religious beliefs uh, may be seen as vilifying or humiliating based on religion. Um, and uh, uh, those are all things that this law requires there to be a policy about. But you're right. I think their hope is to try to suppress those kinds of uh, uh, viewpoints as much as they can through both this law and its future follow-ups. Well, who decides what hate speech is? Well, here the, the government uh, uh, defines hateful conduct to uh, include speech that vilifies, humiliates, and cites violence against a group or class of persons on certain bases. So they say that under this law, I could have a policy that just says, you know, I don't respond to anything, and then just complainants will decide what they think is hate speech. They send me an, an email, let's say, and then I say, I don't care. 
So their claim is the government isn't going to get involved in, uh, uh, in enforcement here. Uh, however, um, it's still a viewpoint-based law that imposes a legal obligation, even if a relatively modest one for now, on platforms precisely because the government is trying to suppress a viewpoint. Interestingly, the, the New York Attorney General's papers defending the law uh, argue repeatedly that the law is content neutral because, again, we could have a policy that doesn't mention even hateful conduct, uh, even though on its face it singles out particular kinds of viewpoints as the sort of thing that the government is trying to at least deter and that I'm required to have a policy about. I'm not required to have a policy about speech that offends based on politics. I'm not required to have a policy on anti-police speech or anti-American speech. I am required to have a policy about these particular viewpoints that the government has defined. Right. I mean, it's sort of like what we're seeing play out again, in a case emanating from Colorado, the 303 creative case that's before the Supreme Court on religious liberty, which is sort of a follow up to the uh, case, uh, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, where the Colorado Civil Rights Commission is essentially um, setting uh, what is required of private actors in terms of specific performance with with what they do, whether it's baking cakes or designing websites. And the idea is it's all under the rubric of non-discrimination, but it's only particular kinds of alleged discrimination they're actually interested in. So it clearly is uh, in these Colorado cases and the Supreme Court's already held so in the Jack Phillips case. I think they're going to do the same in three or three creative case. It clearly is the government putting its finger on the scale for which viewpoints are acceptable and which viewpoints are not. So I think that's right as to the New York law. As to the Colorado law, I uh, co-wrote a brief that opposes that application of the Colorado law. But I don't think the Colorado law is viewpoint-based. Uh, the Colorado law does uh, just ban discrimination based on race, religion, sexual orientation, and the like. Uh, um, it doesn't mention particular viewpoints as to speech. It just bans status. discrimination. Most of its applications, it says like, pardon? It's status-based. Well, right, but that's the same as, say, Title VII, the uh, Employment Discrimination Law from 1964. Mm -hmm. It's the same as the Equal Protection Clause has been understood, or the Voting Rights Amendments talk about you can't discriminate in voting based on race or based on sex or based on age uh, um, uh, or having paid a poll tax, uh, uh, but they don't ban discrimination based on other things like where you reside, let's say, or whether you're a citizen. Uh, so uh, the, you could have anti-discrimination laws that target conduct. The problem is in this case, the Colorado law, that is to say in the Colorado case, the Colorado law is requiring artists to create speech or speakers to create speech. Uh, and that's the problem. But in most of its applications, it isn't about speech and it's viewpoint neutral. It's true it bans certain kinds of discrimination, but that's the nature of, uh, again, a wide range of equality laws, anti-discrimination laws in the country. Well, right. But I mean, one wonders aloud what the Colorado civil rights uh, minders would say if uh, the Catholic Church said to a, uh, a, uh, a um, an atheist or uh, to a gay a graphic designer, um, you're violating uh, my religious liberty, you're violating my, uh, my constitutional rights by not designing this website the same way that an LBGT group is saying that uh, or about uh, the 303 Creative. Well, I would say that in that kind of situation, I think Colorado courts... Uh, uh, and probably the commission, but certainly the courts, uh, would have an obligation to enforce the law uh, the same way they're doing with, with regard to the uh, with regard to the, the same-sex wedding site. I mean, it is pretty clear uh, that uh, the, that the law would require uh, people to film uh, religious ceremonies for videographers or to create websites for uh, for uh, uh, for religions, and uh, you know. The Catholic Church would just be entitled to sue itself under the law. Uh, um, it's not even a matter of prosecutorial discretion, generally speaking. So I think they would have that right. Uh, I would hope that they wouldn't exercise it because I'd hope they'd appreciate that that's an improper intrusion on uh, uh, people's individual conscience. Exactly but right. I, 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 I have no reason to think that Colorado courts uh, uh, would somehow try to get rid of that case, uh, given that it's, that it's clearly covered by the law. 
He is Professor Eugene Volokh. He's the co-founder of the Volokh Conspiracy Blog, and he's a law professor at UCLA. Professor Volokh, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, very much my pleasure. All the best. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Before you see it on TV, share it on Facebook or read about it in the paper. Hear it here first. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560. The Answer. For an experience at the dentist that's more like going to a spa, meet Dr. Luma at North Shore Dental Group, preventative and cosmetic dentistry for the entire family. Hi, I'm Dr. Luma. I welcome you to come to North Shore Dental Group and let us show you what it's like to enjoy going to the dentist.